Can you take a technique that requires hands-on, one-on-one instruction and turn it into an online course? Can you develop that course by having fun on Twitter? Today I'm talking with the Alexander Technique guy, Michael Ashcroft. We're going to talk about the Alexander Technique, how Michael built his course, and what's next for new versions of his course. This is Course Builders, and I'm your host, James Stuber. Let's jump into the chat. What is the Alexander Technique? So the Alexander Technique is essentially a way to notice things that we're doing and then to learn how not to do them, if you like. And that that might sound simplistic, but it's surprisingly difficult to to say no to a response to a stimulus in a constructive way. Very often we'll go off and do the opposite, for example, or we'll think that we're doing something, we're actually doing something something completely different. Mm -hmm. So it's a way to encounter a, a, a habit and learn to step out of it and let something else happen instead. Cool. Can you give an example of where using Alexander technique might be, might be helpful? Yeah. So, I mean, it's commonly taught in the context of, of posture and the way we move and that kind of thing, but I prefer more, um, I guess, real world examples that people can relate to like having a conversation. So let's say that you're talking to your boss or something and they say something that's a little bit triggering for you. Um, Alexander technique allows you to kind of zoom out and see your habitual response, which might be to engage or withdraw or say something snarky or something. And we'd, I'd use the word inhibit. So prevent that process from kicking in, um, and choose a more constructive path. Awesome. Yeah. There's, there's actually a, you've got a great YouTube video where you sort of demonstrate uh, where you expand your awareness and, and you, mm-hmm. you speak and then you, you sort of contract your awareness and you speak and it yeah. starts to feel like uh, almost like you're creepy or something. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it's really incredible. I've, I've shown that video to uh, a few people, both both um, with the audio and both muted as well. And and yeah. everyone I've shown it to is like, whoa, yeah, I can I can see you can see the change like just through through YouTube. So it, it's it's really cool that uh, that you're able to demonstrate that online. Um, yeah, I had no idea that would work actually. So I know it works in person, but when I, I tried it in that video, it's almost incidental. I didn't actually expect that to be demo of that, that, um, trait. Um, but I guess what's interesting about that is, I mean, some people have said like, oh, look, he's just like narrowing his eyes and moving less and that kind of thing, which is all true, but that's not what I'm doing to bring about that change. I'm not consciously coordinating my face or my body or my, my gaze. It's just like, I'm doing something else, which, which is to do with my awareness. And these things happen as a result. And that's kind yeah. of what I get into in, in the course. And that kind of thing. Yeah, that's what I, I mean, that's what interests me about the, the Alexander technique so much is that it's not, yes, all these things are happening, but it's all, it's all as a, a consequence of the sort of condition that you put in, you know, if you, mm. you're expanding your attention and your awareness and, and suddenly the, the body or the body language shifts, it's not like a, it's not a conscious, like you said, it's not a conscious narrowing of the eyes or a conscious, yeah. uh, you know, stilling of the head or, or whatever you want to call it. Mm. So that's, that's been really cool to see. Yeah. I mean, so what, cool. so typically my understanding and correct me if I'm wrong, is that, uh, most, most Alexander technique coaches are working in person with your, mm. your hands on you. And it's, it's yeah. a very, uh, very in-person pro- process. Uh, mm. how did you, how did you realize that you could teach this online? So it was quite a journey, actually. Um, I guess it starts with the fact that I had a very unconventional training. So my own my own teacher describes his training as like the anarcho left wing of Alexander <laughs> Technique, <laughs> kind of an outlier in the field even. And we work a lot more with direct um, playing with awareness. So that's the way in that we use, whereas others would use posture and movement and that kind of thing. Mm. So I think having that grounding really helped me. Otherwise, I would have struggled to relate the movement stuff to the online context. In terms of figuring out that I could teach it online, it was really a kind of build in public process and trial and error, just playing around. Love it. Um, I've often I've often joked that if I'd picked anything, any single topic to teach online or to make an online course out of, it would not have been Alexander's technique, because if I'd set out to build the course to begin with, I wouldn't have known how. So I actually found that like riffing on the on the concepts and tweets, people were like, "Oh, this is cool. I get something here." I kind of I made tweet games almost like kind of while you're reading this, do this exercise kind of thing, which people seem to like. And from that, I thought, well, okay, that, that works. I wonder if I can do some Zoom calls um, and do video versions of this. Um, and then when, when lockdown happened in, back in April, I just took a week off and, and did like 30 Zoom calls in that week 
Um, so <laughs> it was just, yeah, it was just a lot of fun and like, oh, this works. So I just kept building like iteratively from that. That's awesome to see. Um, you know, I'm a huge fan of building in public and, and, you know, you're an example of where that's, that's really, it takes you places that you never would have thought you would have gone to. Right. Yeah, exactly. It's pretty cool to see. Yeah. So you're, I mean, your background is, is not in, in posture or, or movement. Uh, your, your background's actually in the energy sector, which is yeah, surprise. An interesting. <laughs> it's an interesting juxt juxtaposition between, you know, en energy sector and yeah. uh, the sort of postural behavioral attention awareness thing. Um, how has, I mean, have you been able to take any of the skills that you have developed in your professional work as an engineer or sorry, an, as an energy consultant um, and, and brought that into your, your education and your teaching? Yeah. So, I mean, I think the fact that, so going back even before the energy stuff, I studied physics at university as my undergrad. Um, and I think having that background really helped me to approach the training of advanced technique very differently from others. So very much kind of like almost trying to prove my teacher wrong or for mm. kind of what are the falsifiable hypotheses I can bring into this um, and then kind of dissecting it from first principles, um, which I think really helped me. And then the working in a very professionalized space, like yeah, energy consulting, strategy consulting, big corporate, all that kind of thing, kind of helped me to communicate these things very directly and simply. Um, and so I think that combination has helped avoid a lot of the, the woo-woo traps yeah. that it's very easy to fall into. So I, I like that I can talk to kind of normal people, if you like, um, and, and start where they are and bring them into this world rather than say, well, here's this woo-woo and then they'll just like disconnect, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I have to be honest, the first time I heard about Alexander Technique and like, ooh, it'll make your posture amazing. <laughs> it was kind of, yeah. I wrote it off as another, you know, uh, sort of woo-woo spiritual practice, but- uh, Exactly. You know, coming at it from a sort of a, a STEM background where you're more, you're more on the, the, the rational, the logical side. It, it's, it's almost more convincing that this is something real and something workable that, you know, uh, someone, someone coming from a physics background is, is talking about this stuff. So I think that's mm -hmm. really cool. Cool. Thank you. It's been, it's been an interesting journey for me because there's plenty of stuff that I can't explain necessarily um, that I've experienced through the training and then working with people, but I kind of, I, I don't allow myself to fall back on, on things that exist outside of science, so to speak. So I often say stuff like, I don't know how this works. I know that it works. Yeah. And hopefully I can figure out the how kind of in sometime in the future. But the fact that I kind of went into it with a sense of how can I re falsifiably repeat this over and over again in different contexts and have to be proven to me in N equals one ways shows there's something here. And okay, now I can work out what those things are. Yeah. I think that's something that people get sort of backwards about science is often the the hypotheses you're developing in science are a result of these sort of like N equals one, you know, kind of mm. hard to verify, but you, you see it in real life and then you can go and pursue the paper. It's not like you can't just, yes. you can't sit around and wait for someone to write a, a huge in-depth analysis on whether Alexander technique works or not, because yeah. I mean, that might take decades or it might never even happen, but what you can do is you can try the exercises. You can uh, take Michael's course if you want. <laughs> And uh, Please. You know, see, see if it, see if it works for yourself, right? That, that's that's sort of the the way to to move about and to figure out mm. if stuff is useful or not. I think. Yeah, exactly. And I, I would love there to be much more like you know double blind randomized control trials of this stuff, but you know they're expensive and difficult and hard to set up. But that the absence of those things, and there are some you know studies in that domain, but the absence of those things doesn't mean that what I'm working with is not real. It just means that those tests haven't been done yet. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I get pushed back saying, you know, where are the studies or doesn't replicate or that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and I just say, well, like, how do you, how does any scientist have the idea to do anything to get to that stage? It's based on experience and anecdotes and N equals one and all that kind of stuff. So as long as you're careful about the scientific method that you pursue while you're doing that, you don't allow yourself to get pulled off into nonsense on the way. There's nothing wrong with that approach. Yeah. It's like, you're, you're finding something interesting and that's why you're pursuing mm. the question more than yeah, exactly. just trying random, random stuff. Right. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So you just, have you completed the first course or is that still ongoing? So I launched, um, I actually, I pre-launched the first 50 people with just like a table of contents essentially. It took me a while longer than I planned to make it, but it's now live. That went a couple of weeks ago. 
um, and people are thank you very much and people are going through it um, now it's really interesting and like insight into course creator land is that on podia you can see like how progressed each individual is through the course mm -hmm. like how many things i've clicked on and that's been you know illustrative in itself of like oh almost no one's gone through the whole thing but many yeah. have gone through two thirds of it and that kind of thing or like it's taken longer than i thought they would because it's quite a short course but still people are kind of doing it bit by bit that kind of thing so the plan is that i've got a, a circle a community space a forum next to it and I'm encouraging people to like share their experience going through it. Let me know what works, what doesn't work. Um, and based on that, I will make a version two with um, new content, better content. I'll probably release to another 50 people again, just have like a second intake, like cohort. And then once I've made the revisions after that, I'll like put it live for general sale, I think. Awesome. Yeah, I love this iterative approach. Um, you know, this is how like Tiago Forte at Forte Labs does his courses. Mm -hmm. They start with a small group and then work their way and take iteration from the from the feedback they get from students. So yeah. it's really cool to see that you're doing that as well. Um, I just on that, actually, I don't think I could do it any other way. Like it's the same it's the same process of the building out loud, the, the, the Twitter thread that I have, the master thread and the, the Zoom course, all that stuff was like an iterative learning how to teach this stuff. So if I'd gone straight in, like, here is my magnum opus, like thousand dollar AT course, it would have been absolute nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> and I think doing it this way, it might take longer, but like I, I might get to a thousand dollar course one day, but it will have been tested through by that, you know, thousands of iterations of like individual, you know, that person, this person, that tweet, and it all, it all builds up into a knowledge base that I can then deploy. But without that, it would be just silly. I yeah. I mean, you said it might take longer, but actually, I, I think you'll end up getting there faster because you're seeing all this iteration and, and all, mm. getting all this feedback from people. Uh, you're going to get to both a better point and a more more final point than if you were to say, uh, go off in, into a cabin in the middle of nowhere and, and write your huge magnum opus, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think the, the benefit of working public, which I like, I recommend so highly, and that's probably my biggest learning of 2020, which I didn't know existed before. Yeah is that people get to see what you're going through as you're doing it and they become fans along the way. So the fact that I was able to sell to 50 people from a mailing list of 600 at the time, it's um, crazy. is like, it sold out in four hours. I was astonished. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I saw your email and I was like, okay, I'll do that later. And then he sold out, I was so mad. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it'll open again soon. <laughs> um, but yeah, like, like it just, it wouldn't have been possible. That's the thing, and it, it required that journey. And now people are fans because they went on that journey with me. So that it's the kind of it's the audience first approach that David Perel talks about. It's like you build the audience, kind of you iterate back and forth with your ideas, and together you make something. Yeah. So I guess put that way, like I haven't made this, right? I've created a space where people have made this together, but I couldn't have done this on my own, and that's really important, I think, to recognize. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. I, I like that. Yeah. I mean you know, just having having a group of people who are all interested in the same space and, and working together towards it is such a powerful thing for learning both both for you for and for all of your students too, right? Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, exactly. And there's something in that because like, people also like push back and say like, this is nonsense on Twitter and that kind yeah. of thing. Well, like on the zoom calls, it just doesn't work. Um, and even in person, like, there's a, a first lesson anxiety of like, I need this person to get something to like, see what they haven't seen before and it's up to me to like give them the experience and like one of the scariest kinds of lesson or like most disillusioning is when they just don't get it yeah and it's like 45 minutes and even like trying to show them this thing like get out of the car basically is the analogy and they're just like what what is this nonsense this is all pseudoscience and they don't like this and you're like ah oh. <laughs> so learning how to deal with that and either accept it like some people just aren't ready for this or aren't open to it or learn the diagnostics of like, okay, I think what you're doing here is this. That's why it's not working. So how about you try this? Mm. Which again, the, the doing in public really helps with that. Yeah, I mean, what are what are some strategies you've used to to get people from, you know, get people out of the car? Yeah, so one of the, the biggest failure modes, I often talk about expanded awareness. Um, and I guess I should talk about why that is, is that in an in-person lesson, when I, when, I, when a teacher puts their hands on you to like make some corrections or adjustments that, the switch on um, what Alexander called the primary control, which I won't go into now, but it's like kind of a more alert state, more kind of switched on state. Um, it comes with a sense of expanded awareness, like you're more connected to the world, you're more expanded, you're more like just bigger somehow. 
Um, so I, I kind of realized that you can you can teach the other way around. So rather than using hands to bring about the awareness state, you can use expanded awareness state as like a, a subjective training environment almost. So when I guide people into the expansion, like imagine that there were an aircraft 10,000 feet overhead, just check that you could notice it. A lot of people will get stuck there and instead like start thinking about it. Yeah. It's like, oh yeah, there's, there's this plane. It's like, I'm, imagine, like, I'm imagining it right now. I'm not aware of the space directly. And being aware of the space directly is getting out of the car while imagining a plane above my head is using the, you know, kind of hit buttons to open the door, right? Yeah. Yeah, this is, you know, not having done any like direct training with you or anything like that. When I've, when I've tried these techniques, one failure mode for me is that exactly that I'll, I'll, I'll be like, oh, I'm trying to notice the things that are around me and, and I'll yeah. fixate on, on, yeah, the, whether it's the plane or the, you know, the, the plant that's over there or that I yeah, have to totally. do the dishes later, you know, so I'm not expanding my awareness. I'm just bouncing around from thing to thing. Yeah, exactly. And, and this was my, my main learning on the, the zoom calls I did was that I was at first, it was just a kind of kind of scattergun, like here are some ideas for around AT, let's just see what lands. Yeah. And then over time it kind of converged to a common format. Um, it's like, I have to introduce these ideas in this order, in this way, and then chances are you'll get something from it. Mm -hmm. And that was the the kind of the thing I landed on almost by chance um, from those calls, partly because I was getting anxious about the calls. It's like, oh God, how do I give this person the right experience? I don't think I'm crazy, this yeah. uh, Twitter guy. Um, so like, I was thinking quite hard about like, how can I guide this thing? And that seems to work. So I have a bunch of like games and ideas and that kind of thing. Um, that help people overcome the most common traps, but I'm, I'm still learning that I mean, there's still loads, I'm sure. And I'm always looking for more ways in. Awesome. How have you, you know, so you're making an online course. And I think when most people think about online courses, they think, oh, you know, I'll sign up for Udemy or, or whatever. And there'll be, uh, some guy talking to me <laughs> with a, a slideshow yeah. and maybe there's, maybe there's a built-in quiz or something like that. How is, how is your course structured? Is it, is it all lectures? Is it all exercises? Is it a mix? Like, how does that work? So the, the fundamental idea was to reproduce the, the Zoom calls that I did, because what I found was that I didn't want to keep doing just the same intro Zoom call in my evenings and weekends, given I have a job. So yeah. I had a waiting list like longer than I was, able, I was willing to do. And I was like, okay, how can I, how can I turn this into an asynchronous format basically? So it's essentially, the, the main part of it is like a series of videos between five and 10, 13 minutes long, where I guide people through certain experiences. I was like, now you're learning this, notice this thing. Okay, now you're doing this. And there's like four or five of these steps that show someone like, okay, this, there's this thing going on here that I can, I can notice, I can control and play with. And then around that, there's like some text lessons, some extra video of like kind of context. Um, it takes about two hours to go through the whole thing, I think, end to end. It's not a massive thing um, to do it in the morning. Um, but I guess I, I have a bit of um, course fatigue in terms of like the Zoom call ones. It's like, well, there's this enormous cohort. And you know, I've done Second Brain, I've done Rite of Passage, I've done a bunch of these like awesome courses that are transformational, but they are a lot of like headspace. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to not do that, essentially, for this yeah. one at least, maybe one day, but not this. Yeah, courses like building a second brain or like rite of passage, they really do take a lot out of you. It's, you know, it's yeah. almost, uh, <laughs> you gotta, you gotta really dedicate a huge chunk of energy towards, towards doing that. Mm. Uh, yeah. So like, you know, you've got this first cohort, people are mm. taking it and coming along. What are, what are some things you wish you had known when you first started filming your course and first started putting it together? So when I was doing like all the stuff over the year, I've had some, I had some great ideas for things I could do, but I, I've lost loads of them. So my second brain wasn't working as well as it could have been basically. Um, so like, oh, that'd be a cool game. Oh, that'd be a good thing to talk about. Oh, and it's gone. And like what I found, what I, what I really wish I had done is record those 30 Zoom calls mm. because what tends to happen for me is that as I'm ad-libbing and talking on a call, like 45 minutes, just stuff comes up. And I'm like, oh, that was cool. I, I should put that in the course. And then it's gone. <laughs> it's completely gone. And I wasn't, I wasn't like taking notes afterwards. I wasn't recording. And I've lost a lot of good stuff that I could have just like put the recording of myself in the course as a version one, right? But yeah. instead I, I had to buy a camera and sit down and like record myself, which 
So looking back, I could have made a much jankier version one, put it out much earlier and just been like kind of stitched together my side of the video mm. from the Zoom calls. But I didn't do that. And that's my, that's a big regret, I think. Yeah, I mean, you know, going through that iterative process, it would have been would have been nice to have all of those yeah. notes and, and all those those learnings, you know, written down. I find that, yeah. um, you know, right now I'm going through a public speaking course and, and when the words start flowing and it starts feeling good and you're speaking fluently, you almost lose the part of your brain that's remembering what's going on. And yeah, yeah like you can, you can have a session that goes really well and then leave it and go, oh, like what did, what did I even do? Like how did, yeah. how did, how did I get the student from A to B? Hmm. And that's a really good point actually, because like when you're fully in flow like that, when you are, when the words come from somewhere where you don't know where they come from, it, that's when the the self-reflective part goes away so almost by definition you are not able to catch your most spontaneous stuff yeah because like you just like oh look at that that was cool but you're not like coordinating it if you like um so i would i would definitely record a lot more of myself just ad-libbing i think um and actually the the videos in my course have ended up being so i didn't script any of the videos um because i'm not good at reading from a script and i become yeah. much less natural so instead i just like okay one take the whole like 13 minute video of one take me talking to a camera um stuff will come up it's not perfect it's not like exactly what i wanted to say but i think the the one take ad-libbing version is more natural and more useful than having like jump cut jump cut come cut 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 kind of thing throughout the thing and or me reading from a script um i want to figure out how that works right now but it's it's something to play with i think yeah for sure i mean it's it's, it's t you know, for a, a course like this, where you're, you're talking about expanded awareness and that sort of thing, it almost feels more natural to, to have an off the cuff, an off the cuff conversation instead mm -hmm. of, uh, like you said, a, you know, your standard YouTube style, jump cut, jump cut, jump cut. Yeah. It, it's a tricky one because like, as I want to respect people's time, um, and I guess with like increasing investment, as I study, push up the price to reflect mm -hmm. the quality and then the content. I don't want people to think like, oh, this is just like some guy talking to the camera about stuff. Like I've put a lot of work into the structure, the framing. I'm trying to use multi-level summaries as best I can um, and just help people to see what they should be learning while they're learning it rather than like, here's just a download of content you figured out. Um, but there will be a point where I think, okay, is it now time to put the cuts in or to script this or to like kind of be much more precise with it or will it always be okay to just free lip, free form and ad lib? And will that be okay? I don't know yet. Yeah. I was going to ask, how are you making those decisions? Like what, what to do next to improve your, your next version of the course? Um, it sounds like you, maybe you don't know, but, uh, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on what, how you're thinking about that. Yeah, I think it's two things. One is, so most of this is like a felt sense. So in the same, in the same way that I couldn't have set out to be here, I was like following my curiosity or what was fun or playful mm -hmm. for me over the summer yeah i'm doing the same kind of thing now so it's like what what calls to me or what stands out or what ideas do i get when i'm not thinking about it like oh i can do that kind of thing and that's one of the main things but the other thing that i'm really pleased that i've done is set up that forum um because i mean there's 50 people in there now there's not a huge activity which is fair enough it's not like there's no cohort there's no reason to be in there but people are like introducing themselves and they're like saying, Hey, I got stuck here or it'd be really cool if you could do this. And I think like that is so valuable that I, I couldn't do without it, particularly as it grows, like having real people say like, this is where I got stuck. Please fix it is, is fantastic. So it's those two things are, are how I'm building the next version. Yeah. It's super helpful to get that, that feedback. And mm. as you know, um, both of us probably take a lot of courses and, and there's lots of communities to join. So there can be some sense of community fatigue, but I, I really do think that one of the most valuable things you can get out of a course is, is meeting other people who are interested in the same thing and, and working through the same problems that you are. So I'm, I'm glad that you have a, a circle form. That's really cool. Yeah, it's, it's fun. Um, it's, I'm trying to avoid the, the thing I've seen in other forums where it's just like you log in and there's a bajillion channels and mm -hmm. a million notifications and like it's just too much I disengage it's like like discord servers I'm in a bunch of twitter based discords because there was a link and I'm like I just never go in there yeah <laughs> it's, just, it's just too much it's too fast I have enough going on on my phone that I just don't go in there um twitter is the one thing that's avoided that because I don't know it's public or like I, I can keep on top of that somehow it, that was fine 
Um, but yeah, I want to avoid creating um, a drain on people's headspace in mm -hmm. the forum. So I'd rather have shorter, like longer form content that moves more slowly and feels like a peaceful space rather than a frenetic moving fast, finish the, this assignment this week kind of, kind of space. Yeah, for sure. So your, your course doesn't have any specific deadlines about exercises or anything like that. Is that, how do you think that impacts the, the students and how they, they work through your course? So I, I do include like games people can play with, but on their own time. Um, I haven't got anything like do this by this date, mm -hmm. um, partly because I don't know how, um, but also because it doesn't really lend itself right now to that kind of approach. I'd much rather give people insight like, hey, this thing exists. Um, here are some ways that you can play with it. Yeah. And then what I think people find is that it kind of just like shows up in their life. Like they kind of forget about it. Then they're like talking to a partner or going for a walk like, oh, that, that thing that Michael said just like appears. Um, and that's what I want. I'd rather they like be mindful of the process rather than try to do it too much because that kind of goes against what I, what I teach, I think. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, I think uh, something like this is almost, it's, it's, it's sort of a lifelong skill to, to be able to expand and contract your awareness. And mm. it's, it doesn't seem like it lends itself very well to, uh, here's a, here's a five day course, go cram it. And, and suddenly <laughs> yeah. you're, you're an expert, you know? Yeah. So yeah, it's good. No, to exactly. See it, yeah. It's this kind of thing where you can't, you can't cram it. It's also not knowledge. Like it's not a download of content from my brain to yours. Yeah. Um, and that, honestly, this is why I actually liked courses like um, Second Brain and Rite of Passage because they are transformational. Um, and it, so when I finished Rite of Passage, for example, I was a different person. I, I, I was someone who was confident to be like myself in public and write and share things. And, and that process continued and has continued for the last year and a half since I finished it. And I'm very grateful for that. But I'd rather kind of focus on that transformation angle than like you will learn the content <laughs> kind of thing. Cool. How, how do you think um, building this Alexander Technique course has transformed you? That's a good question. Um, I think it's shown me that I'm the kind of person who can make an online course, which is cool. Because um, for a long time I've been like, I've spent tens of thousands of pounds on online courses um, since 2013. Um, and I've always been interested in the, like, the, the approach, how it's done, how it's structured. Um, being someone who can do that. And now I'm like, oh, I've done that. Like, here, here it is, it's early stage, but it exists. Um, but there's a bunch of stuff that goes with that of like community building, becoming comfortable on camera, making friends online, um, learning how to deepen my understanding of my own subject, right? Because I don't, I'm not a full-time teacher but as on technique, I, I, I don't want to be a kind of conventional teacher. But the fact that I've got this avenue means that I, I have an excuse to dive into the books and the references and I like, think about all the topics deeply. Um, so it gives me a, a focal point for this stuff. Um, and what I love about the course is that as I learn new stuff, I now have a place I can just put it, right? So like, oh, this will fit in there nicely. And what I'm doing is I'm learning for myself and creating and thinking, but I'm also like enhancing the course for existing and future students. And that's just like a win-win for everyone. I think it's great. That's awesome. So you're you're improving your own organization of, of your own knowledge about Alexander technique. And you're also helping everyone that's, that's in your course at the same time. That's really cool. Yeah, exactly. Cause like, it's really hard to like, Alexander's books are really hard to read. Like they're awfully, they're really badly written. <laughs> yeah. Um, I once, I once found a hundred word sentence with one comma in it. And I was like, this is, this is awful. Um, but now like, I think Tiago talks a lot about when you have a project or something that you're researching for, when there's a reason that you're doing it, it things just make more sense mm -hmm. so now if i'm reading it like oh this this topic oh this would fit really well in there you just absorb the content in a very different way so it really helps me like just focus in a, in a useful way that i couldn't do otherwise i think you can't just read this up for pleasure i would say yeah it's almost you have to take a, a sideways tack at it it's like i if you just sat down and tried to read these absurdly long sentences it, it would be yeah. a huge pain but if you're doing it for something else, uh, suddenly it, it becomes, uh, I don't know if fun is the right word, but it becomes much more enjoyable. Yeah, exactly. I think I've seen, again, Tiago say that everyone should make an online course um, just because online education will be a huge thing, but also just the process of doing it is really fascinating. Like it's this whole full stack thing. Like it's mm -hmm. not just one skill, it's a, a long list of skills that 
are unreasonably transferable. <laughs> it's almost it's almost unfair. Um, there's you know there's no other time in life when I I kind of get used to talking to a camera that isn't where there isn't someone looking back at me. Um, and I think into the future that'd be a really valuable skill. But otherwise, I wouldn't care. You know, the whole YouTube video thing as well is kind of get comfortable with this because it's good for the course. Yeah, and it's it's just a wonderful way of learning new stuff. Yeah, it's cool how this this one sort of north star of making an online course sort of collects all these sort of other meta skills that are going to help you. Like even if you never make another course again, I, I think mm. the ability to talk on camera, uh, the ability to teach people things. Uh, especially such something so ephemeral as, as the Alexander technique. I think those yeah. are skills that are going to help you no matter what you do. That's, that's really cool. Yeah, exactly. And there's something else as well about like stepping into yourself fully, like learning how to be authentic, because I, I think a lot of people kind of like set up, how can I make an online course? Like what can I make an online course about and start the other way around rather than like, what am I really interested in and want to learn more about um, that I can just get, get really nerdy about um and go from there and yeah it's just been it's been transformation in that sense for me to make it um and i'm really excited to see where it goes because like it's just a, an entirely new way of being if you're a full-time consultant who's used to trading your mind time for money <laughs> then it's like oh look i've made this thing that can go teach people while i'm asleep yeah and it's just like wow that's crazy that's great <laughs> yeah that's such a huge huge leap to finally buy into the fact that you can sell things online and you don't have to be there for it, you know. You, yeah, exactly. You, you can make a thing once and sell it, and it's it's yeah, it's such a weird mind mindset and a mind shift to go through. Yeah, and that was the main shift I went through. I think the reason I made a course was like I didn't actually want to. I didn't I didn't actually expect to for this content, but when I realized that I couldn't scale myself, I was like, uh oh, okay, how do I scale now? Mm. That's a course, isn't it? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I think, um, you know, Tashin and I went through the same the same process when we made the digital productivity coach. It was like, we can't keep answering the same question over and over again. Let's, <laughs> yeah, just, exactly. let's just bundle it up and, and give it to people, you know. Uh, yeah, totally. I mean, David Perel talks about this in Rite of Passage, I think, where like one of the early things you have to do is write an FAQ blog post or something. Yeah. Um, and this kind of feels like a version of that. So it's not just like a one FAQ question. It's like a series of... I'm frequently asked about this entire topic. How do I just make that go away, essentially? And one other benefit, actually, of that is that it allows you to go much deeper. Yeah. So now that I've, what I've essentially done is built a first lesson or a first couple of lessons in a course format. And now I can just say, like, just go do the course, then come and talk to me. It frees up my head space to be like, okay, well, what's beyond the, the first lesson? Mm -hmm. And I can go much, much deeper by consistently building out the, the lower level content. I can go higher up. Yeah, so you can almost you can almost leverage the the course as your sort of introductory stuff and then mm. with your you know with the whatever few one-on-one -on -one clients you do get into you can go much deeper yeah. and yeah that's awesome so not only do your students get to go deeper but you also get to go mm. go deeper instead of spending all your time you know getting people just out of the car right yeah totally and then these things work really well together i'm finding so with the, with the course there, I also do like a couple of one-on-one -on -one coaching clients because mm -hmm. they really enjoy it. And I use a lot of the same, I use a lot of the content from AT mixed in with um, some, I, I do coactive coaching training and a lot of that stuff I kind of, I bring in as well. And what I'm finding is that, that by doing the coaching, I'm like, I'm in that ad living space that I was talking about earlier and stuff just comes up. I'm like, oh, where did that come from? That's cool. Yeah. So these things riff off each other. So the better the course gets, the more I embed the basics. And then in the coaching, I get better at being a coach because I've got the basics in my mind. Then other stuff comes up and like, oh, that's cool. I can go in the course. And it's just this wonderful, like virtuous cycle um, that wouldn't exist if there wasn't a, a place, a repository or a structure where the content already was. And I think that probably applies across all kinds of courses and in most disciplines. Yeah, for sure. I mean, this is, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to a lot of early course creators is because I eventually want to make a course, but like you, I had, cool. right, I'm at the position where I have no idea what, what that's going to be. Right. So mm -hmm. I figure by talking to people and, and pursuing what's interesting in public, uh, maybe I'll stumble upon something that makes sense for, for me and for the people who, uh, are eventually going to be students. Mm. So out of interest, how did the, the digital productivity coach come to be? Cause there must've been a. A reason for that's come about yeah i think you know I, um 
Tashin and I have been, you know, we met in building a second brain and have, you know, chatted off and on over the years. And we both were, you know, I was, my blog was sort of positioned as a, you know, a, a productivity guru type <laughs> blog. And yeah. I, you know, I continually was getting these FAQ, you know, FAQ style questions about, uh, yeah. you know, getting things done and, and all these techniques and what is building a second brain and, and talking to Tashin, he also was getting similar questions. And I think both of us together, we sort of, we looked at, at the work that Tiago did and realized that, um, you know, Tiago was sort of getting into this expert problem where the stuff he was talking about is so far removed from what a lot of people where they were at already there, there wasn't really a bridge from, I'm a total noob at productivity. I don't even know like how to use my calendar, you know, up to sort of the esoteric stuff that, that Tiago was talking about. And so we, yeah. we saw that there was a gap there and we wanted to sort of build, build something that would take someone from, you know, I don't know how to use my calendar. I don't even know how to like do email processing efficiently yeah. and get them to a point where they could go like, Oh, Hey, like, you know, now that I have this, this foundation of uh, a basic level of digital productivity, I can, I can sort of leverage that foundation to go do cool projects or to, to learn further, um, whether that's building a second brain or, or pursuing their own personal projects. So that's, that's cool. yeah. You know, so eventually we turned that into a course and, and, you know, now we're, it's sort of, uh, it's, it's less a course and more a, a choose your own adventure style of thing. Um, yeah. 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 Cause I guess you don't know where someone's coming in at. Right. So if they're like, Tiago is too advanced for me, but I'm not a complete beginner at this. You have the problem of like, how do you let people pick where they are almost? Yeah. This is the, this is the, the, the sort of thing that we were trying to, trying to overcome was when he, you know, when he first talked to a, a coaching client one-on-one, -on -one, yeah, I think, mm -hmm at least for me, I was spending probably the first two or three sessions just figuring out where they were at and what kind of yeah. skills they had. And yeah, we, we sort of structured the the coach in a way that it, it became like a choose your own adventure thing. Like, Oh, like I, I already, I already do inbox zero. Like that's, that's easy for me. Yeah. Like I don't need the, I don't need to go through this whole like module on, on setting up my calendar and setting up my Gmail mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, and it lets people slot into where, where they're at. Mm. There's something else that I, I love about this space is that as the online course ecosystem develops, there are almost like additional courses that can kind of fit around them. Um, Cause like you couldn't do that necessarily unless second brain existed in a sense, yeah. like that's too advanced, but there's this space beneath that defines where you can play or where you can easily make a, a contribution. I think the more that we all do this, we can kind of like, like what a visa calls them scenes, like mm -hmm. where like, someone making something for something else and just doing that in public creates a scene. Um, and then we can just like fill in the gaps like this, like, like a jigsaw or a tapestry or something. And that really yeah. excites me. Yeah. Likewise. I, I love the sort of community that's built up around Twitter. And now it seems like a lot of us are, are sort of shifting uh, to like YouTube and building courses. And I, I love to see that, that, that scene grow. Um, it, it's interesting you say that because uh, my, I've been, I've been thinking a lot about like aesthetics and developing your own, developing your own taste. And I, I just am not at the point where I'm a good person to write about that. Um, but my friend Dio just like started writing about all this like aesthetic stuff. And I was like, awesome. Now I don't have to think about it. I can just point people at you. <laughs> yeah. 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 And it's the same thing with, you know, if I had come across Alexander technique and it was like, Oh, this, there's something cool here. You know, it would have taken me who knows how many years to like dig into it and really get it. Totally, and, yeah. Yeah. And now I can just say, Hey, go talk to Michael. Cause he's got a course on it. Um, you know, look at chapter speed. Yeah. There's something in there around like, um, finding the on ramps. So I get my, one of my ambitions for Alexander technique is, is to be an on ramp for it on the online yeah. world, because there are plenty of teachers out there, but they market themselves around like, you know, posture or performance, acting, sports, music, that kind of thing. And the people who go and see them are the kind of people who go and see them. So like this, they're not branching outside of their, their groups. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm quite proud of the fact that most people who are following me had never heard of it before. Yeah. Or like would never have thought about it. If they had heard of it, they thought it was something else and that kind of thing. So there's really something important that I think we're all, or a lot of us are doing on Twitter and in, in this scene 
is like saying, hey, there's this cool thing over here and I'm going to reframe it for you in an interesting way so you, you care about it um, rather than disregard yeah. it or not know about it. So, well, there's so many, there's so many, you know, useful systems and techniques and, and ideas that are sort of buried by bad marketing, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, and what you're doing is, is bringing the Alexander technique to uh, an entire group of people that never would have ever even heard of it. So that, that's really cool to see. Yeah, thank you. So it's a lot of fun, honestly. And I, I think if it hadn't been fun, I wouldn't be doing it. Yeah. So this, this goes along with the whole like using Twitter to make friends thing, right? That was a complete shock to me. Mm. I first got into this when I saw like I did Second Brain and Rise Passage. Like, okay, David and David says that you don't need to use Twitter, but you kind of do because you're not going to build your newsletter subscribers just by telling your friends and family, and then like it'll stop. Like, how do you actually get people to care? And obviously, it's Twitter. And then after being a really bad reply guy for a couple of months, I think mainly for Diago, I was like, oh, I get it now. Okay, there's this thing here that I can figure out and play in. And that's been fantastic. Um, but it's another another meta skill of course creation, I guess, is that like, how do you build an audience without explicitly trying to build an audience and being scammy about it while still kind of semi intending to like have spread the word almost. It's a, it's a weird thing to navigate, but I think it's a critical part of being a course creator. Because if one of my 80 friends, my other teachers I know, had built a course, it might be amazing, but who's going to buy it? Yeah. Because there's no audience. Um, so it's it's important to recognize that that's that's part of the journey with and kind of tone down the, the ick factor around marketing or selling or promoting and that kind of thing as well. And I think what we found on Twitter is a great way of doing it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, before you said you, you never would have thought of yourself as someone who would make a course. Um, do you feel like Twitter help shift that identity for you? Yeah, I'd say so. I mean, I always wanted to make a course, but I was endlessly stuck in that what about topic. I was like, well, what do I know about? I know about um, regulation of energy networks in, in GB. Like, well, <laughs> I don't want to make a course about that. Um, there, are, there are other energy consultants who are way better than I am, who do a way better course and like meh. And they're, they're probably um, going to have fun doing it, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And like, I enjoy it, but I don't love it to the extent that I want to spend my evenings and weekends yeah. doing what I do during the day. And I, I think it's a personality type thing. It's like, I, I can't do 70, 80 hour weeks on one topic. Mm. However much you pay me, I just can't do it. Um, whereas I can easily find that an extra 40 hours of work if it's something else, <laughs> if it's just like my stuff and I get to self-direct it, yeah. um, which is what's happened. So Twitter's just been a wonderful outlet for that. Um, that's like, oh, I can actually make friends here. This is great. And while I'm while I'm making friends, I can learn and play and build and all that stuff. And it's been very much that that went that way around, honestly. I would say. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel so lucky to have found uh, the the Twitter community that we're in because mm. it's it's such a big shift from what you know. If you ask the random person on the street, what do they think about Twitter? They'll say, well, oh, yeah. it's it's full of people complaining about politics and and celebrities doing stupid stuff. You know. Uh, totally. So, yeah. Yeah, but you know the way if if you use Twitter like the way we're using Twitter, where you're you're connecting with people and you're you're talking about cool ideas and you're sort of uh, pursuing things that you find fun, uh, it, mm. it's such a better experience. And yeah, yeah. One of my one of my good friends, like in real life, um, only uses Twitter to like follow um, people talking about COVID, like yeah. all the analysis and like, of course your experience sucks. Like mm. of, like of course it's terrible, but he just finds it baffling or at least intriguing, it's like, no, it's a nurturing, nourishing, like friendly space of people who are nice and interesting. Like, what are you talking about? It's a cesspool of hate. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, it's, it's such a funny, you know, shift in the way you interact with a, a tool or interact with, um, you know, a community it totally shifts the way mm. you perceive that tool. Um, mm. I feel like there's a tie into Alexander technique there, but I'm, I'm losing it. <laughs> Well, I guess like the way that I've been building it has been an expression of it. So I've been interested in the process, kind of playing around and not feeling compelled. And I'm looking for new ways of being. I know it sounds really woolly um, as, as a tenuous connection, I think, but there is definitely something there around. Like if I'd set out to be like, I'm going to build X a year ago, I would have, first of all, not built X. Mm. Or if I had, then X would have sucked. <laughs> so it was it's the fact that I can like I'm going roughly that way and I'm gonna pay attention to the process by which I do it 
has kind of allowed me to like notice all this other stuff that's available there, like the friendships and the community and the, the play and the memes and the, all that the good stuff. Um, and I'm going to end 2020 with like, oh, I have an audience now. That's surprising. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, that's just fun. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty crazy how, you know, just sort of setting up the, the conditions of like being friendly and interesting on Twitter sort of guides you towards this, like building a course and, and yeah. Yeah, building an audience. It's it's pretty it's pretty crazy. Well, even doing this, right? So like a year ago, this would have been completely baffling to me. It's like what you're having a recorded conversation with a guy from the internet. Yeah. You go on YouTube talking about a co- what? Yeah. Um and like when I do you know um Colin Morris who mm-hmm. like, does the movement stuff, like he he was the first one to reach out to me. It's like let's zoom. Yeah. I was like, Oh, this is weird. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Let's let's zoom then. And he had like a fancy like camera and microphone and stuff like that. He was set up. But he'd been in this for a while longer than I had. Yeah. I was like, okay, this is a thing. I guess the game of Twitter is like me, people, vibe, DM, Zoom, friends. Oh, cool. All right. But you have to learn that and kind of not be averse to it. But like the fact that we're doing this is just like the epitome of the awesomeness of what we found. I think. Yeah, I think likewise. If you had told me a year ago that I'd be <laughs> talking to people from the internet. <laughs> And posting on YouTube, I would have thought you were crazy, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You touched on uh, yeah. you touched on a, a topic that I think our, our little corner of Twitter is also interested in, which is this um, sort of idea of coercion. And you know, you, mm. you were saying like if, if you had set out to start a course and you know, you made a big plan and you said I was gonna film yeah. this video on this date and all this sort of thing that it wouldn't have happened, right? Mm. Uh, I think that there's a sort of popular idea of of non-coercion and, and sort mm. of letting things happen. What do you what do you think about that whole scene? It's an interesting one. So the, the term coercion doesn't show up in the Alexander Technique world. Um, I just recognize that what people talk about is part of the same thing. Um, so I think unlearning coercion, I think is partly what Alexander Technique is. Um, so I'm really supportive of people highlighting that the way to achieve things is not necessarily to push yourself around. Um, so, I mean, this is also, this links to parts work as well, kind of the IFS stuff, um, the internal family system stuff. Mm-hmm. So like, okay, I want to do the thing, says the voice, but I feel resistance. Another voice says, do the thing. Yeah. And you go like, ah, I need to do the thing, <laughs> right? That's the same. So when I talk about doing and doing nothing are the same thing, it's kind of the same process. So like. When you yell at yourself, that's just the same process. That's not going to help because you're caught in one process that just yeah. has two facets to it. The way out of that is to recognize it is one process and stop doing the entire process, if you like. And that's where this comes in. Very cool. And it's interesting to hear that there's no mention of coercion in Alexander Technique because it, it, it feels like there's a lot of parallels there between mm. the, two, the two fields. I'd say that the the ideas come up, but it's not framed in the same way as people discuss it on on Twitter. Um, although I would say that one of Alexander's ideas, and he did this actually, was, was to create a school, um, which would have a different schooling method essentially there in New York. Um, and to be honest, that's that's something I want to explore more. Like people focus entirely on the the use of the self stuff, as one of, them, one of his books, but they they forget that he had like much grander plans for mm-hmm. the world and his technique. And I'm really curious like what that was. And I think it, it relates to non-coerciveness. It relates to accessing what we are as humans when we're not pushing ourselves around, essentially. When we have well-calibrated cells and we know how to use ourselves appropriately, when we function optimally, perhaps. Because um, I know full well that I I am most creative, I'm most productive, I'm most like worth having on the world, if you like, mm. when I'm allowed to express this creative, natural, authentic thing freely and it's fun. Yeah, I agree. As soon as I start like saying, oh, I have to do this now, uh, people like jobs, whatever, it, it just diminishes somewhat, right? And that's that's the thing that's missing, I think, in the world. And I want to help unlock. You know, we're coming up on the end of the hour here. I want to be oh, yeah. conscious of time. Um, but I, I did want to ask you uh, if you have any cool music recommendations. <laughs> every time every time you recommend a, an album or a song or something, I'm like, yeah, that's awesome. I love it. Well, thank you very much. Um, so my my like music tastes are quite electronic. So um, one, what I'd recommend is a label actually 
called um, Anjuna Beats. Mm -hmm. um, and they have another called Anjuna Deep, which is like the deep version of that. So it's trance, basically progressive trance. Um, what I recommend is they have these albums that do every couple of years. So Anjuna Beats 11, Anjuna Beats 12, and that kind of thing. Yeah. And they are just so wonderfully mixed together that you have like an hour and a half or two hours of a continuous flow of music where there's no sharp breaks between songs. Nice. And it starts out soft, but it has a peak, and it's just it's just gorgeous experience. Um, so anyone who doesn't know about Anjuna Beats should definitely go and check out Anjuna Beats um, and thank me later. Cool. I'll make sure to, to link that below. <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah, so where where can people find you? Where can they find your course and find out more about Michael? So I guess I'm I'm very active on Twitter, I'm probably too active on Twitter at M underscore Ashcroft. Um, I have, so where I talk about all this stuff, uh, the 80 stuff is at my newsletter, expandingawareness.substack.com. Um, and I have a website as well at michaelashcroft.org, which has a couple of blog posts and I should have more on it really, but the main action is on Twitter, unfortunately, but I need to go expand that stuff out a bit more, I think. Yeah. Awesome. I'll link those below and make sure to cool. go, go follow Michael on Twitter. Uh, yeah, he's, he's a prolific tweeter and, and it's, <laughs> it's all worth reading. So it's good. Cool. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks so much for taking the time today to chat with me. It's been been a good one. Thanks for having me. I've really enjoyed it, and I'm I'm really excited for this this scene that we're creating as well. Like particularly like the um, the YouTubers who are, who've moved over and are doing cool stuff over there. It's just really it's really fun to see all this stuff like building and happening. So, yeah, it's, it's going to be a fun adventure. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, have a good one. And you. Thanks a lot. See you around.